ओम नमो अरिहंताण ओम नमो सिद्धाण ओम नमो आयरियाण ओम नमो उवचायाण ओम नमो लो ए सब्बसाहूण ए सो पंच न मुकारो सब्बपावपणासनो मंगलाण च सवेशि पढ़म हवई मंगल अर्हंत भगवत इंद्र महिता सिद्धाश्च सिद्धिस्थिता आचार्या जिन शासनो नतिकरा पूज्या उपाध्याय का श्री सिद्धांत सुपाठिका मुनिवरा रत्नत्रयाराधिका पंचई ते परमेष्टि न प्रतिदिन कुरवंतु वो मंगल कुरवंतु वो मंगल उस्वाल एसोसिएशन ऑफ द यूके तरफ थी आप सौ ने प्रणाम आप सर्व नु आरोग्य सुखाकारी सारी रहे अने खूब सारा कार्य करवानी शक्ति देव गुरु अने धर्म पसाए प्राप्त था एज परमात्मा चरण में वंदना अने प्रार्थना Jai Shinendra Pranam Badane and good evening. Um, welcome to our sixth Oshwal Owl webinar. Uh, today's subject, uh, we are discussing a very important subject matter about bone health and particularly looking at um, orthopedics and physiotherapy and how this can help to get us our life back. Uh, a very warm welcome to everybody, um, everyone that has been joining these webinars. We've had some fantastic feedback from people. So thank you for that. If you do have any questions for today's panel, please um, do post those questions under the question section on YouTube. Uh, but today we're going to be discussing this very important subject. And also we have um, a very uh, moving case study where um, our, um, our case study today is going to be talking about a remarkable recovery uh, following um, an accident. I'm going to um, pass us over to um, Tushabai, who's going to welcome us today. Tushabai uh, needs no introduction, but the never, nevertheless, he's a trustee of Oshawa Association of the UK, former president and um, very much supports these webinars and has been here um, every week uh, working with us. Thank you, Tushar Bhai. Thank you, Prafula Ben, and Jai Jindana uh, I hope you're all keeping safe and well, and a good evening to all of you. Maaf tojo, Gujarat English, Tarak Bolai Jai Tom. So today, Jai Prafula Ben Ekidu, Ajaya Pro 6 webinar che in the whole series that we've done, and Juta Juta Kopik Supara Pelayave Che, Bebe Vike, Guruare. So today's topic is on hips, knees, and much more. Yeah, जब उम्र था ही तब अपना हाथ का दुखे, पाँव दुखे, छाती दुखे, हाथ दुखे, बत्तू दुखे. So today we have some excellent uh, professionals. Uh, we have a consultant uh, orthopedic surgeon, uh, Gurudat Sitsodia, and Emni साथे चे Menka Patel. She is a senior uh, specialist in uh, physiotherapist, community physiotherapist. So today we got to hear from both of them about Susu Apanetakli Thait of Esukaru Juen. And of course, Chem Profila Bene Kidu, we have a live example that somebody went through Tori difficulty Thaiti in life ma, suit you to Kevin and you to, and how we came overcome those difficulties. So over to you, and we'll talk a bit more about this later on. So thank you, Profila Ben, and thank you for joining here today. Thank you, Tushar Bhai, for that lovely warm welcome for everybody, um, as always. So 
Uh, we're privileged and very, very pleased to welcome uh, Mr. Guru Dutsi Sodia. He's a fellow of Royal College of Surgeons, a consultant orthopedic for knee and hip um, surgery. Uh, and he is actually hails from South Manchester. He has particular expertise in repair and reconstructive surgery and includes sports injuries. He also treats arthritis of the knee and hip particularly um, keyhole surgery. And he also teaches um, and supervises junior doctors. He's an examiner, both in the UK and in Canada. We're very, very pleased to have you with us to talk to us more about knee and hip surgery and uh, much more in terms of orthopedics and, and your work. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, uh, Prafula, Prafula Ben. For the introduction. It's really great to be here. Jay Janinder, everyone, and uh, namaste. Uh, thanks very much for your time. So um, I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully everyone can see that. Uh, okay, so uh, again, thanks very much for the introduction and thanks for the invite uh, for uh, uh, inviting me to speak today. It's a real a privilege and a pleasure. Um, I'll be hopefully giving you an insight into osteoarthritis of uh, the knee and the hip especially and how we can manage it. Um, mainly I'll be speaking in English, Torugano uh, Gujarati, I'll try, but uh, when Saval uh, at the end, then just feel free to uh, ask any questions, please. So again, just briefly, I'm uh, a consultant orthopedic surgeon. I'm based at uh, Manchester University Foundation Trust and I specialize in knee and hip surgery. So firstly, what is arthritis? Well, it's actually the meaning of arthritis is joint inflammation. And it's the most common cause of disability in the UK. And we think more than 10 million people are affected by arthritis. The main features of it are uh, joint pain, swelling and stiffness. And it can affect many parts of the body, but typically uh, the hands, feet, uh, knees and hips are most commonly affected. There are different types of arthritis. And the most common is the osteoarthritis type, which is where you have wear and tear. And there's inflammatory arthritis, like rheumatoid arthritis. And then there's crystal arth arthritis, like things like gout. Uh, you can get arthritis from uh, an injury. Hopefully we'll hear about that from uh, Ranjit Bhai later. Uh, and then there's arthritis that you can get following infection of the joint. So with inflammatory arthritis, uh, this is, can be a serious condition. But what happens is the body's own immune system actually attacks soft tissues around the joints and eventually the cartilage is then attacked by the immune system and then the bone as well so it's um, severe in that it can cause joint destruction and major deformities like you can see in this picture this patient's hands have um, quite severe deformities and examples of uh, inflammatory arthritis are rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis where you have these psoriasis patches and along with that, you can also have this destructive joint arthritis. But the good news is that we have some, in the last 15 to 20 years, some really revolutionary medications that rheumatologists can provide you. And so it's really important to try and get diagnosed with this early and prevent um, long-term and permanent deformity. Gout and pseudogout are two types of crystal arthritis. So this is um, something that you might find quite surprising that crystals can actually get deposited inside the joint and it's extremely painful uh, and you can see from these pictures just how red and sore and inflamed these joints look most commonly it affects the the big toe but it can affect the knee the hands and over time you can get these calcium deposits as well which can be painful it's thought that the risk factors mainly relate to alcohol excess uh, obesity, 
uh, and certain diet types of diets, so meat eaters in particular can, can have a high risk of it. Um, and the way to prevent it is to try and minimize some of those uh, lifestyle um, uh, choices. So reducing or stopping alcohol, drinking more water and um, natural fruit juices. It's found that sweet, artificially sweetened uh, juices can make it potentially make it worse. And there are some medications that we use sometimes to treat it when it's acutely painful and sometimes to prevent it as well. So moving on to osteoarthritis, which is the focus of uh, my presentation, is this is a degenerative disease process. So it's, it's a process that means that it gradually gets worse with time. And what happens is there is wear and tear of the cartilage. So the, uh, the cartilage at the ends of the bones in the joints, like knees and hips, uh, gradually get more and more uh, worn and torn. And this, over time, they can, there can also be inflammation around these joints, so painful swelling, uh, swelling of the joints. And it's the most common type of arthritis. And you can see here uh, that at least 8 million people in the UK have osteoarthritis, and it's the most common cause of disability here. Uh, older people in their 70s and 80s tend to have a higher risk of getting it, and women tend to be at more risk of having it than men. And you can see from this graph that the knee is the most commonly reported joint to be affected by arthritis. And from this map here, you can see uh, just the darker colours indicate where osteoarthritis has the highest prevalence. So around London, the West Midlands, but also the Northwest and Scotland as well. So to understand osteoarthritis, it's, it's worth knowing exactly what a normal joint looks like. So the hip is like a ball and socket joint. And you can see from this picture, at the top of the thigh bone, you have the ball, and this is covered in nice, shiny cartilage. And on the inner side of the, of the cup is also a nice uh, cartilage layer. And so they form nice, smooth gliding surfaces. The knee also uh, is at the ends of these bones has a nice smooth layer of cartilage and it has the kneecap or the patella in front of it. And in between you have uh, a cushion as well, which we'll come on to, but also uh, inside the knee, you have these important cruciate ligaments and ligaments at the sides of the knee that help to stabilize the knee and make it more of a complex hinge. So it doesn't move in just one direction. You have some rotation and some sliding that happen as well. And if we look a little bit closer, at this diagram where we're looking at one half of the knee joint, we can zoom in and look at an actual photograph of the inside of uh, the knee joint. And this is taken during keyhole surgery. And you can see how the end of the bone is covered in this nice smooth uh, cartilage layer. And in between there is a, uh, what's called a meniscus, which is a type of cartilage or a cushion that helps to uh, pass some of the forces that pass across the knee joint and help to prevent damage to the cartilage uh, next to it. And just looking even closer at this structure of this cartilage, it really is an amazing structure that's designed to try and uh, protect uh, not only the bone underlying it, but also itself. And one of the things to bear in mind is that it has no blood supply and no nerve supply, so that if it does get damaged, then that damage tends to be permanent. And so it's really important to look after your uh, joints whenever you can. And this is really what happens with osteoarthritis. You can see in this diagram here, the cartilage is completely intact, normal. But over time, when there are micro injuries uh, again and again, the cartilage gradually gets worn down. And you can see the cracks forming, the craters in this cartilage. And eventually, it can wear down to bare bone. And Again, uh, you can see in these photographs, on the left-hand side, this is normal cartilage. And with time, if there's damage, you can get this wear and tear osteoarthritis, which is moderate in this picture, and then it becomes more severe towards bare bone. So what are the causes of arthritis, osteoarthritis? So there's a number of different uh, potential risk factors, but age is probably the most common one. So the older you are, the higher the chance of getting osteoarthritis. As I said, uh, females tend to have uh, a higher risk of getting it. If you're overweight or obese, then that leads you uh, an increased risk of having osteoarthritis. If you have joint injuries with sports or accidents, 
uh, then again, this can lead to uh, a risk of arthritis in the future. And that might be decades down the line. People who work with a very strenuous activities, so laborers, heavy manual work laborers who do this kind of heavy, stressful work every day can lead to, uh, can lead to a risk of getting arthritis in the future. And we also know that arthritis can run in families too. So what are the main signs and symptoms? Well, most patients with osteoarthritis, they usually complain of uh, pain. So uh, look out at the end of the day. Uh, sometimes with uh, more severe pain and symptoms, they can get pain even when they're at rest in bed at night. And when the pain is affecting the knee, it's usually made worse by going up and down stairs or crouching or kneeling activities. Uh, and with the hip, some typical features are when you get more pain when you're putting on shoes and socks or cutting your toenails and the pain is usually in the groin or the side of the hip or the back of the hip. Also getting in and out of the car can be really painful with, with hip arthritis. Um, stiffness and swelling are really uh, common features so sojourn is really important. Some people find they have a creaking noise or grating sound that comes from uh, the joints so again it's something to look out for. And all of this gradually leads to uh, lower and lower mobility levels. So people might not be able to go up the stairs. They might be walking shorter distances. They might need a stick. And eventually they even lose some of their normal functions like um, putting, you know, doing their cooking and putting out their shopping and kneeling down to reach a low down shelf or something. So this is a, it's a gradual process and it can get worse and worse with time. So how do we diagnose it? Well, x-rays are the most common way we, we diagnose it. And here you can see uh, on the left-hand side of the top, a normal knee x-ray. And between the bones, you have a nice joint surface. And that means the cartilage is uh, pretty much intact. But here on the right-hand side, the bones are grinding on, on the bone itself. There's no space. And that means the cartilage de chair, it's gase geluche in between the, the bones. We sometimes do an MRI scan, and here you can uh, see that, and it sometimes shows us how the, what the extent of the arthritis is across the joints. Occasionally we use ultrasound scan, and sometimes we do injections to make a diagnosis to see if the injection numbs the pain in that particular joint. This is an extra of uh, a hip osteoarthritis. You can see in a relatively normal hip on this side, the ball and socket joint is maintained and there's a nice space between the two surfaces. And that's not actually a space, it's cartilage that takes up that gap. But here on this side, there's no space between the ball and socket. And that means there's some severe osteoarthritis wear and tear. And you can imagine how painful that can be. So lots, we've heard that lots of people can have osteoarthritis. And unfortunately, over the last year, the pandemic and the multiple lockdowns has actually made things worse. Lots of people have um, been able to do less exercise and activity, so they've gained weight and their symptoms have got worse. Um, we also know that elective operations have stopped for, for several months uh, in orthopedics, certainly. So the waiting list is you know, around 5 million uh, in terms of operating in the NHS at the moment. It's, it's, it's increased hugely. Even in our clinics, we're seeing fewer patients, even though we'd like to see more because of social distancing. And in our hospital for several months, physiotherapists weren't able to see uh, patients face to face because of social distance, distancing. So it's had a major impact on millions of patients around the country. The other factor is uh, steroid injections. We commonly inject steroids to knees and sometimes hips, but there was some national advice uh, during the pandemic to say, we should try and minimize the use of steroids because there might be an increased risk or uh, becoming sick with coronavirus if you were to get it. So that's also played a part in uh, patients suffering more over the last year or so. So what are the treatments? Well, this really depends on um, several factors. Firstly, how severe the symptoms are, the pain, the effect on your daily life. So are you able to work? Can you go for your long walks? Can you walk your dog? Things like that. Some patients have different functional demands. So for example, you can see this patient is, lives in a care home, uh, in a residential home. He only goes from his chair to his bed, to his room. He doesn't need to, um, he's not particularly that active. 
Whereas this patient is younger, they want to play golf, they want to work, and therefore their needs are different. We have to treat that accordingly. Sometimes patients who are older have more illnesses and therefore might not be suitable for an operation. Whilst other patients like this might have severe deformities with their arthritis. And so uh, sometimes we intervene to try and minimize um, further damage in the future and avoid a more complex operation much later on by operating on earlier on. So what can you do to help yourself if you have osteoarthritis? Well, for some patients like those with mild arthritis or those with low activity levels or uh, a very high risk of surgery, then it's better to choose non-operative, non-surgical management. And, and this is usually based on exercise and physiotherapy. So it's really important to try and maintain your range of motion, especially for the knee, which can stiffen up. But also muscle strengthening is important because we know that weak muscles get tired easily and tired muscles can become painful. So not only do you have a painful joint, but the muscles themselves can become sore. So it's really important to do regular and, and um, often exercises quite often uh, to help your, uh, your muscle strength. And we have proven exercise programs like Escape Pain uh, which can be run by physiotherapists and GPs can actually refer you into these groups to um, help as a, as a group of people with arthritis uh, improve your mobility, your pain and your function. So definitely worth thinking about these things. And in the same way, modifying your lifestyle activity is really important. I mean, it's worth bearing in mind that five times your body weight goes through each knee every step you take. And most of us take more than a million steps a year. So you can just imagine a patient with osteoarthritis, how much force is going through those knees in, in, a, in a knee that's already damaged. So anything you can do to try and lower those stresses is going to help. So losing weight is really important. Avoiding those high impact activities like running is also really, is going to benefit your knee if you have damage. And then thinking about those lower impact activities like swimming, cycling, is really important as it improves your strength in the knee, it can improve your range of motion. And also um, using these walking poles can help you too, um, to help distribute some of the load. Other non-surgical management uh, options are medications. So we've all heard about paracetamol and anti-inflammatories. You can get some stronger painkillers from your GP as well, and they can be effective. But some people may not know about um, anti-inflammatory creams which are, have been shown to be effective. So Voltarol cream or I believe gel uh, can, can be have shown to be effective and they're recommended by NICE if you haven't tried it. Likewise, there's something called capsaicin cream or a chili extract cream, which also is recommended by NICE for patients with knee arthritis. Uh, uh, so it's worth giving those options a go if you haven't tried them. Some patients who have a uh, mild deformity in their knee, so if it's angled one way or the other, or if they have some slight instability, so it feels like they can't trust their knee, then wearing a splint or a brace like this can help them. And occasionally some patient, patients may get benefit from what we call visco supplements. And you may have heard of things like chondroitin sulfate or glucosamine, which is a, a natural supplement for the knee or, or for cartilage. There, there isn't strong evidence behind it in terms of the science, however, Many of us see so many patients taking it and for them it, it helps. So if it helps you, then there's no side effects um, and it's worth taking. How can we help as uh, uh, health professionals or, or surgeons? So there are injectable options. We've all heard of steroid injections and we've been doing fewer of them in, in the last year, but we started to do them more and more as we get more confident about uh, vaccinations and they can give relief or improvement for three or four months for some people um, but sometimes it's a matter of just a few weeks. Hyaluronic acid is another type of treatment which is a normal constituent of cartilage and it's thought that it can help um, replenish that supply and also help with lubrication of the joint uh, but again it's expensive and it's not offered on the NHS. Platelet-rich plasma is an, a relatively new treatment option in orthopedics anyway. It's been around for about 50 years in different specialties, but in orthopedics, we've been using it more for the last few years. And it involves taking your blood sample, spinning it in a centrifuge, 
and taking off a portion that's rich in platelet cells. And these platelet cells come from your bone marrow and they're rich in growth factors. And they can be helpful in treating uh, or healing any damaged tissues. They don't grow new cartilage, they're not stem cells, but it's been shown to help um, in healing, but also in an anti-inflammatory effect. So that's worth considering if uh, you have access to it. Moving on to surgical options, keyhole surgery or arthroscopy is something that we perform for certain indications. Um, and that's for people who have arthritis and who may have a meniscal tear or symptoms from it. So this patient has some mild arthritis, but they also have a bad meniscal tear. And you can remember, if you remember from my earlier picture, what the meniscus normally looks like, the cushion of the knee. Here, it's ragged, it's torn, and it's giving the patient symptoms. So we can go in there with the keyhole surgery and trim that away. Likewise, sometimes there can be a loose uh, piece of cartilage or bone floating in the knee, and that can give some mechanical symptoms. So we can take that out. And this is how we do the operation, just by making two very small holes in the knee, and we put instruments and cameras in that can do the operation. Uh, while we watch on the screen. Um, so that's a, a good option for certain conditions, but not all types of arthritis. Joint replacement is obviously um, something that we, most of us have heard of, and it's reserved for severe disease and severe symptoms. And it's one of the most successful operations that all of medicine has to offer. Um, we perform around about 160,000 total knee and total hip replacements in the UK every year. And the average patient is in their 70s. And you can expect most uh, total hip and knee replacement to last you know, over 20 years in, in most cases. And this is uh, just some x-rays and pictures of what uh, these knee replacements can look like. So on the left-hand side, uh, we've got an example of a partial knee replacement. And, and the reason why they've got partial knee is because only one half of the knee here is affected by the osteoarthritis. So they've had that part of the joint resurfaced. And that's how you should see what a, a knee replacement is. It's not actually a replacement. We don't take out the whole knee. We actually take the worn surface away and replace it with uh, metal components here and here. And then there's a plastic bearing surface in between that forms a knee joint. And on the right hand side, you can see an example of a total knee replacement. Again, it's more of a cap that fits on the end of the bone and the top of this bone and there's a specialized plastic in between. This is an example of total hip replacement surgery where the ball and socket has been replaced. And you can see the different types of components we use. So usually the metal stem, but it can have bearing surface, which is made of ceramic or plastic, even metal. Uh, and sometimes we can cement these implants in as well. And again, a very highly successful operation. A few patients may be candidates for an osteotomy. And this is an operation which involves cutting the bone and resetting it. And the patients that might benefit from this are those that have a younger patients that are in manual work and that have arthritis just in one compartment of the knee. And you can see from this x-ray, this middle x-ray, that before the operation, this axis, this mechanical axis went through the inner side of the knee where the wear and tear was. But after the operation, after the bone has been reset, the axis passes through the middle of the knee. And that just means the forces across the knee are evenly distributed. But there are some risks of the operation and it's not suitable for everyone. So in summary, uh, knee and hip osteoarthritis is a really common condition. It can be really debilitating. There's several risk factors. Often this is due to injury or genetics or obesity. Uh, and the lockdown and the pandemics haven't helped matters over the last year. It's really caused some severe symptoms and, uh, and problems for patients. But the solution really isn't just one option. It's, it's looking at multiple options and trying those different things like the anti-inflammatories, the, the exercises, the making uh, of um, modifications to your lifestyle and your weight. And surgery, we, we reserve that for just severe disease. Thank you very much for listening, everyone.
Thank you so much, Guru, that for taking us through that um, journey. And um, so interesting because we hear about arthritis a lot. We hear about osteoarthritis a lot. Um, and actually that knee thing, I've, I've had it before. I, I had my knees making that noise that you just talked about. And I've been doing exercises for, for that for a little while um, and feel much better. There's a little kind of theme developing here. So all of our webinars that we've done, people are talking about lifestyle changes, exercise, and maybe a few diet changes. So even today, you've talked about that as well. And thank you so much for sharing um, all of that really useful information with everyone. Um, I'm now going to um, introduce um, our community story today. This is a remarkable story of an extraordinary um, recovery from um, Ranjit Bhai. Um, and he is going to talk about what happened to him um, um, 18 months ago almost and how he now stands here to tell his story. Um, it's, a, it's a remarkable story and we're going to share some images of his journey after he's told his story. Um, just a little word of warning, some of those images may be a little upsetting for some people, but um, let's hear from Ranjit Pai and his, his story. Hello, namaste everyone. My name is Ranjit Limbachia. I'm 44 years old. Um, my story is like one of those freak uh, movies that you watch and that's like you waking up in the middle of the night and you just think where you are and basically starting your life all over again. So uh, okay, my story is like a jigsaw puzzle. So, and my memory is also a bit um, scrambled and speech is also affected um, as I had a stroke and had brain injury. So please do forgive me uh, if there's any mistakes. I'm um, Gujarati bhi aave chhe. Kono koi sawal hoy to you know Gujarati ma bhi my main language Gujarati chhe anyway. Um, okay, as if I can start the story, it's like when you wake up and not able to open your eyes at all, and you just think, where are you? You know what's happening? And then when you open your eyes, you've been told that you were in a coma for a month. And um, as a month has passed, um, after waking up from coma nearly for a month, spending further three weeks in ICU, still had no voice due to tracheostomy. stomach, I was not able to say what I needed or needed any help. If someone can help me at that time, I was not able to ask for help. After Um, uh, um, I still had many um, uh, surgery while I was so not conscious. I had many dialysis, had blood transfusions. After gaining some strength, about up to four months, and losing nearly 20 kilo of weight, I wasn't even able to lift a toothbrush. My wife had to help me brush my teeth, help me feed and everything while I was in the hospital. If my wife didn't help me, I don't think I would have been here. Um, it's basically I was told afterwards as I was gaining some consciousness and I was told that I had a stroke while riding motorbike. Very strange. Even many of the doctors never heard of this. Say someone having a stroke while riding motorbike and, you know, and surviving. Um, when I was, um, I mean, uh, when my wife arrived at the hospital, she was told that I only had, had one percent chance of surviving. One percent. As um, not only that, my left leg was crushed between bike and a metal bollard because I lost control as I had a stroke while riding bike. So my left leg was broken in seven different places multiple injuries, multiple internal injuries, mainly that's what affected a lot. 
um, due to the um, uh, stroke and then my internal head failed, kidney failed, uh, liver failed. So basically I was like um, kept alive in induced coma. So, so sorry. I, I still do not have any memory of uh, uh, many of the stuff that while I was, uh, um, you know, like still under heavy um, medications. So there's so many things going around. I still like, like I say, I have no memory of that day. What happened or those four months while, you know, I was in St. Mary's Hospital in ICU. I spent a total of eight months in hospital. Um, like after you know coming around a little bit and after trying to connect the dots, this is how thing it happened. Um, there was like it's like a, like I say it's like a one of those great stories. Um, I mean like I still have no uh, recall like you know what happened or anything like that. But there was a diversion on that day, and unfortunately I was found on a road that I never take. I never take my uh, on my commute. So I had a stroke while riding motorbike and collided with the metal bollard. My leg was crushed between bike and the bollard. Um, I mean, like I said, I don't remember anything, but this was captured on CCTV image, which uh, my brother-in-law and my wife uh, was shown by police afterwards. So they say, well, as I'm riding and I had a stroke and all of a sudden I'm leaned back, and just lost the control. It just took three seconds. So those three seconds changed my life completely. Um, like I said, I have no memory, but uh, after I was told that there was ambulance was there and everything, and I was taken to St. Mary's Hospital. Uh, instead of going to my mother-in-law's house for dinner, I was in the hospital and my wife received a call saying, you know, uh, that to be there as soon as possible. So they were rushed by police car to the hospital. And then she was told that I had only 1% chance of surviving. So from then to now, it's all family's help, um, physio help and self-help. And not to forget, the surgeons that saved my life. Uh, without them, obviously, I know I wouldn't be here. Although I, I get told this every single time when I visit my um, surgeon, saying, uh, "You're lucky to be alive. You're lucky to be alive." But yes, you're lucky to be alive. But what's after being alive is that getting back on your feet. As uh, like I say, you know, your life has changed so much uh, than before. Like we normally do not think at all about using our legs, our joints, or uh, you know, many, you know, parts of your body. It's like if you want to sit down or you want to get up, get a glass of water, anything like that, you just get, it's like your brain. Memory is just muscle memory, just get up and trying to get the stuff by itself. And now, I know it's like, even to get up from the chair, you have to plan your journey just from chair to your bed or even to the kitchen. It takes an effort. But with the help, like I said, without the family's help, uh, my wife uh, stood by me uh, like a rock. She was in the hospital from 10 o'clock in the morning till six in the evening, every single day while I was in St. Mary's Hospital. My other family members, they used to come every single day as well. My two sisters-in-law, luckily, um, my mother-in-law, my brother-in-law, they all helped me a lot. Every single day, they used to keep massaging, even though I wasn't awake. Sorry.
Even though I was awake, they still used to keep massaging my feet. Sorry. It's been a tough journey, but with that, like I said, without the help, I wouldn't be here. But determination, mm -hmm. like you want to get off from bad bound to be able to come back on two crutches, able to visit temple, take darshan, visit family. Even the lockdown made it so worse. I was I had double lockdown, basically. Um. So. One way, if uh, um, this technology helped me, even then lockdown, uh, physio helped me via video therapies. Not able to get any rehab from the hospital. The physio helped me a lot. My surgeons helped me a lot. Uh, th there are some like you know, issues, obviously there's always around like not able to get any uh, visits to your GP, even though it's only five minutes away. It's been a year and a half, I haven't seen my GP. All I get prescribed is medications. Just take painkillers. But to be with the family, to be independent, I have been trying a lot harder to get to this stage. Um, but the main thing is, it's like without family, it's help, without physio's help, and mainly without your self help, it's very, very difficult. So main thing is you need is real power and trying to get to, um, get back on your feet and get go far as far as I can. Maybe there's some uh, few images uh, Prabhu Laban will share, uh, like my life before and life now. Um, so if uh, Prabhu Laban can uh, take over, please. Thank you, um, Ranjit Bhai, for sharing that absolutely remarkable story with us. Um, you know, Tamari story, obvious Haji. There are a lot of um, things, you know, about this that you're finding hard to to you know come to terms with. So we're going to share some images of your life as it was before, the things you loved doing, and then you know. Um, what happened after the accident, what you look like. Um, some of them are quite shocking. Um, and then, you know, what, what's happened now? So I don't know if you want to, to comment on any of them as we're, we're going through them. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the day of an accident. Uh, I work in Royal Mail, so I, I was working at the reception. And um, th that day, a delivery came from UPS. Uh, my brother actually works in UPS in America. Uh, my, my mother and brother came the next day uh, when I had an accident. But this was the day when accident happened. So I took this picture just to, you know, like, um, Frank, my brother, saying I got a job in UPS now, so I'm a UPS person. This was the day of the accident. This is me in Ladakh. Me and my friends in India did a motorbike ride. So we hired a motorbike and we rode uh, to the highest motorbike road in the world. 
As you can see, I love motorbikes. This is the Kardungla, the highest motorable road in the world, 18,280 feet. So my love of motorbikes started in India. And uh, it's not that I blame motorbike or I wouldn't want anyone to blame motorbike. It's one of those great things that happen, like I said, at a stroke while, while riding motorbike. So it's nothing could have avoided it. This is me in the hospital, obviously. Uh, these pictures were taken by either my wife or our yeah. brother. Okay. Uh, this is me in the coma on the left side and on the right, that is um, X they call it external fixation. So as you can see the frames all the way up to the hip and up to the shin bone. That's my mother giving her blessings and assurance. And that's the physio helping me. After four months, I was bed bound four months. And this is the first steps I was taking. That's me at home with family. And uh, luckily, the COVID started week after I came home. So that's one way to survive because if I was in a hospital, nobody would have been able to come and visit me and don't know where I would have been now. <laughs> so one way with the family's help, I was at home and uh, way back to recovery. That's me in the wheelchair taken to the temple by family. And you can see at the bottom left, me trying to mobilize with two crutches. Thank you, Ranjit Bhai, for the, sharing that amazing story with us. And can I just see Wipa Ben? Because I know she's there with you. Yeah. My rock. Yeah. Yes, your rock. Hi. 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 Absolutely incredible. And, and thank you so much for sharing that story with us. You know, I often hear um, when people are given exercises to do to correct something, um, people lack sometimes motivation. And I hope this story has helped to motivate people because you have absolutely shown that if you have the will and the willpower, um, you, you can do it. So thank you very much for sharing um, the story with us. And indeed, you, you were thanking your surgeons, your physios, your family, um, and all of that really matters. And, you know, the fantastic jobs that Mary's have done for you. And I think you're having um, some more surgery um, on your leg. Is that right? Yeah, there's, like I said, there's like no single part of my body that's not affected. Starting from brain, I have headaches every day, even now, because of blood clots, uh, tracheostomy, uh, stent, colostomy, splints being taken out, uh, fractured pelvis, uh, right, uh, left knee is like I said, is still not recovered, foot drop, uh, right knee damage, uh, ligament damage, uh, ACL tear is still there, uh, plate in my right arm, right hand. Uh, there's still list is like, you know, like I said, uh, kidney failure. I had um, yeah, lungs yeah. failure. <laughs> I had like, like I said, like you said yeah, uh, in the beginning, uh, Bionic Man. Yes. It's like and when I... It, when you I know, you're, you're here to tell the story. Um, absolutely incredible. And I hope our viewers, viewers have found it inspirational. Um, you mentioned physio. And our next guest, in fact, is um, a physio. So Menka, is, um, Menka Patel is joining us today, and she's a highly specialised physiotherapist working in Brent um, in, the, in the community. Um, she started her career at King's College Hospital and has now acquired over 15 years of experience in, in this field. Um, working in the community has um, exposed um, Menka to all core physiotherapy area and is also accredited in acupuncture and pilates. 
Uh, she says the most rewarding job or, or aspect of her job and one she enjoys the most is the feeling, the sense of satisfaction when she witnesses her patients go from strength to strength, enabling them to have a better life. Um, Menka, thank you so much for joining us today to talk about physiotherapy and how it can actually help to give people their life back. Hello, namaste everyone. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I look forward to giving you some good information, hopefully. It's gonna share. I'm gonna be like Guru, I'm gonna do my presentation in, uh, in the physical areas Menka, we're not able to hear you I think are you having um, maybe a, a technical hit issue Hold on, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, that's much better. Okay, sorry about that. So I'll just uh, start a little bit again. So today I want to speak about just a general um, ideas about what physio is, about the areas you'll find, um, looking at orthopedics, obviously, and looking a bit more into rehabilitation and what we can offer, balance training, looking at prevention and falls, why we need the strong muscles, looking at what the NHS advises and some activities and motivation at the end. So just a bit about me. Um, um, we see anyone over the age of 18 um, that is housebound or can't get to a hospital. Um, and I see a mixed caseload. So it's anything that that um, anyone has really. I also have a skill set um, which fills my toolkit, um, acupuncture, Pilates, um, as some of them. And it just helps me be able to give more, more options in terms of what treatment modalities I can use. Third largest. patient education, patient intervention, uh, physical intervention, rehabilitation and disease prevention and health promotion. It's a lot of big words, but lots of it is to do with Um, to increase lung capacity through positioning and other techniques. We will be working with um, doctors and nurses to turn you, move you, to make you at the optimal position to allow that. Um, there'll be secretion and clearance techniques, lots and lots. I'm not going to focus on that though. Going on to neurology. Um, any sort of neurological conditions, physios will aim to sort of look at your quality of life and function and try and make it as easy and um, wonderful as possible. Elderly care. Um, so it's anything that the age related population would get. A lot of it is um, multifactorial. Um, and musculoskeletal is like your outpatient physio. So if you've got, for example, back pain, or sports injuries, you'd go and see them. And community, a specialty like mine, where we would see all of the above really. Um, in your own home. And then you've got other specialist areas like paediatrics, women's health, um, there's palliative care to, to name but a few. So focusing a bit on orthopedics um, for today's um, session. So if you are going to go and have an operation that's elective, meaning it's been planned, you might see a physio beforehand. And the idea is to basically improve and maintain your movement that you have. Um, and to start sort of strengthening before surgery. And that's, for example, if it's your, 
with your right leg forward. Also focus on your left leg, like that is. as well. Unfortunately, you're Mike, I'm really sorry Please. to interrupt. Um, your your sound keeps dropping, so we hear bits and then it goes. Maybe turn your video off if, if it's a bad connection. Should we try that? Because we keep losing the sound. Okay, sure. Sorry about that. I'm going to try and just... Um, it's all right. I was going to try and increase... I'm not sure what else... it could be um, I'm going to go back to the post-operative bit so we can liaise with um, the surgeons and the surgical team um, and follow clinical protocol sorry can you hear me now Yes, we can hear you. I apologise for that. Sorry. Let me start again. Third time lucky. So post-operatively, we'd be liaising with the surgical team and following their clinical protocols and advice because you might be given precautions. There might be restrictions on the range of movement or um, not going over a certain amount of um movement or weight onto a particular leg. So you might have non-weight bearing status or partial weight bearing status. Um, so we'd, we'd be having that conversation with them and following what they would like us to do. You typically see a physiotherapist within 24 hours um, and you would then begin your rehabilitation. So this is just one of the examples of some possible precautions that um, following perhaps hip surgery you might get. Um, so we would be advising you on this and making sure that you are able to still manage your day-to-day -day life whilst following these um, precautions. So one of the things you might be told not to do is... Uh, turn your legs inward, so like swiveling and twisting. Now this, you can imagine, to be running your day-to-day -day life would be quite difficult. So to stand up for a chair, for example, would be quite a, a difficult task. So physios would come here and we teach you how to do sit to stand. We might tell you to extend your leg out, put the weight on the other side, to lean slightly forward, but not over your hip. We'd guide you. We'd also look at the chair height. We might even use other... Um, therapists like occupational therapists, if we need to look at the height of the chair to see if it's appropriate or if you need a different chair. So all of that will take place. And, and that's not just with sit to stand, it's with all transfers and mobility. And we'd advise you to follow the guidance um, until you have your follow up appointment, which can be up to six to eight weeks. So these are some of the typical walking aids we might um, provide you with. They would be based on your height and weight assessment as well range of um, um uh, rollator frames there's as in frames a four-wheel walker here Del this can also be useful indoors as well um i have in the past given a four-wheel uh, recently actually to patients that are suffering from long COVID who may be having difficulties with like fatigue management. So this four-wheel walker is really useful because it comes with a little seat. You can have a little sit down, have a breather rest and still carry on and get yourself to wherever you need to from one room to the next even um, and, and sort of empower yourself to be a bit more independent. 
So moving to some exercises, these are some examples of some hip exercises and they're nowhere extensive of what you would be given. It would be based on an assessment of what you're able to do and, and guided through that. So our exercises are very much tailor made to you. So some of them you can see are in standing, some are in lying, um, some you can see would be causing you to shift your balance. And we would take all of that into account when we um, provide you with your exercises and we'd start at a baseline where you're comfortable, we'd be pain managing you as well at this point then helping you work through it. Balance training is obviously a really big important one. Um, what is balance? Well, balance is the ability to maintain the center of gravity within your base of support. If you part space of so the pink carries between that is your base of gravity and is like your where your mix of mass is, so it's concentrated. And that obviously will shift as you move. So your send, if, if we can impact your base of support, we can actually stabilize your gait. So just by simply widening your feet stance can stabilize the gait much better. You'll often hear physios stay shoulder width apart. So we, we're in with conventional exercises. So for example, static balance exercise doing sideways walking, running in a zigzag line. Um, those are all different types of um, dynamic exercises. Other examples also include um, music-based multitask exercises, which is basically dancing. Um, but if you think about breaking it down and what that means, but you're walking in time to the music, you're responding to a change in the music's rhythmic patterns. Um, and that involves a range of movements that challenge your balance system. So you're required to change your direction, you shift to the other, you may be walking in time, and you're exaggerating your upper body movement. So you're swinging your arms up in the air whilst walking and standing. So all those things will be to build up your balance. Um, that's training all based around that. So moving. Moving on. Balance and stairs go hand. That's up to a physiotherapist or provide you with a rail or a walking aid. You manage this a bit better. Um, so that's one area we could definitely help you with. Just to generalize our sort of toolkit of rehabilitation aids. So we've talked a bit about exercise, improving the joint range, improving the mobility and stability of that, strengthen the muscles that support those joints. And this is very much a process that is progressed and individually managed to help you reach your full potential. Sometimes pain can be a factor and um, hydrotherapy, especially with like osteoarthritis has been found really helpful. Um, so you can even be referred to sort of sessions there at your local hospital if they have a pool. And then there's a falls group which runs. So I know in Brent, we run a few, um, which can be really useful because you meet other people that have gone through the same um, and that sort of helping sort of each other sort of talk about things, things that have helped each other is really useful as well. Um, and other areas that um, physio is found is like manual therapy, um, perhaps taping, soft tissue release techniques, um, electrotherapy like TENS and acupuncture. And they all complement all the different things that physios can offer. Looking a bit at prevention, what can we do to stop that fall that may lead to the fracture that may require the surgery in the first place? Um, well, let's look at some numbers. So a quarter of over 65 year olds fall at least once a year, um, so a third, and a quarter million older people are hospitalized by falls each year. Um, 4.3 million older people have falling at the top of their worry list. That's a lot of worried people. What can we do? How can physio help? 
Well, let's look at four risk factors. And this is where physio will try and reduce that and minimize that. And first of all, we assess you. We'd look at your strength, your balance, your movement. We'll look at where you're less good and we will tailor an exercise program to complement that. We may look at gait analysis and what's that? That's basically how you walk. You know, what's your technique like? We talked a bit about base of support. How wide are you keeping your feet? Are they quite close together? Um, what is your uh, footwork doing? You know, are you shuffling or are you lifting your feet enough? We'd look at any walking aids that you may or may not be using. Are you using them correctly? Is it the right one for you or have you borrowed it? I've heard that a few times as well. We'd also look at your environment. Do you have rugs? Are you tripping up over them? Are they a hazard? Lighting, this is a big one. We have often um, seen patients where they say that they're having to go to the toilet at night and to make sure that they don't wake anyone up, they're not even putting the light on. It's a big false hazard. So switch those lights on or have sort of the night lights on. Um, talking about eyesight, going to the opticians regularly, making sure you do wear your glasses if you have them and having regular eye tests to check that they are okay and in good order. Um, footwear, put the piece slip shoes are very important and we encourage that to give you less risk of sort of falling over and tripping up eating well drinking well and being wealth if this is a struggle due to other comorbidities you can definitely speak to a dietitian to help you and that's the other thing that we encourage as well a very multidisciplinary team approach so if we need to look at any other professionals that may help you we will definitely um, refer you into those looking at your medications it, studies have shown taking more medications it increases your risk. So if you are, do regularly speak to your doctor or your pharmacist to make sure that you're on the right medications. And if there is any side effects of you feeling dizzy or feeling a little bit drowsy with any of them, it's something to pick up and, and speak to them about for sure. So we try and educate and advise. So some of the other health conditions you might have may impact you as well. So for example, Parkinson's, typically have a very shuffle gait and lack of control so this is where again we may refer you to speak to somebody to help you with that if and obviously we would be teaching you how to um, maximize your balance and your walking with that as well we try and aim to build confidence and reduce that fear of falling so why do we need strong muscles well we already know that it reduces the risk of falls Studies have shown by doing um, lift, uh, lifting weights two, three times a week increases the muscle strength. And this helps increase the bone density, um, which increases the overall strength and balance, which will reduce the risk of falls. Um, and of course, your, your walking as well. And better walking gives you greater independence for longer. Just to touch a bit on osteoporosis, um, it's your fragile bones. And unfortunately, us women get affected more than men, one in two in fact after the age of 50, and that's due to bone loss and that tends to increase postmenopausally due to the change in our hormone levels. But men are still affected, one in five have bone fractures after the age of 50 caused by low, low bone strength. And exercise can help, so do do them. Bone strength and density. Weight bearing activity is particularly useful in fighting this. They help make the bones work harder and strengthen the muscles around them, and that will really help. We've already heard um, about osteoarthritis, um, but just to reiterate that X-ray studies show that at least 50% of over 65s have evidence of osteoarthritis and strength training improves range of motion and endurance and strength building. Staying active is effective in managing osteoarthritis. And How long will you be able to manage? So, are you worried? Do you have any of the conditions mentioned today? Well, doing exercise to improve your strength, your balance, your motion can really help you make you feel better and more confident. What does the NHS advise? Well, mainly to reduce time spent sitting or lying down and break up long periods of not moving with some sort of activity, ideally daily physical activity, activities that improve strength, balance, flexibility, at least twice a week. So that's at least 150 minutes of moderate intensity or 75 minutes of vigorous activity, uh, or if you're already active, a bit of both. But what is moderate and what is vigorous? Well, hopefully this will help clarify. Light is basically when you're moving but not sitting down. So that's 
sweating, feel that increased heart rate, you feel that your breathing is a bit faster, you're feeling a bit warm. So you can talk but not sing. So brisk, you really feel it hard and fast breathing. You're not really able to say more than just a few words without having to stop. Jogging, running, perhaps some energetic dancing, riding a bike are all examples. And there's lots more, but this hopefully will show you that strengthening exercises can lead to a better stability, better balance and a better you. And you can do this at home or in a gym. We've mentioned things like Tai Chi. You can also use resistant bands. You can do a bit more gardening. You can even lift weights if that's something that you, you'd like to do. Exercises that use your own body weight like push-ups. Yoga is a great one as, as well as Pilates. I always find that motivation is where people get a bit stuck. And this is my typical advice that I would give. First of all, set realistic short-term goals. Build exercise around your daily activities and do it slowly. So even things like when the kettle's boiling, you do a few mini squats then. If you're, if you're into your Star Plus, they have so many adverts. Even if you do just a few chair-based exercises, you'll be doing really well. So start where it feels comfortable and build up before progressing to something more challenging because people will shy away from things that they don't that find painful or just feel stressed by. Use a chart, achieve daily targets, give yourself some manageable targets, whether it's weekly or daily, and this will help visualize your progress and encourage you. If you're living in a mixed household, do it together. Add some music if you like. The old class. Even factor, there is a video here which you can um, have a quick watch. It's done by the Charter Society of Physiotherapy. Get up and go. Just a few tips and information and some exercises too. I hope it's been. Uh, Menka, Ben, thank you so much for um, that really helpful presentation. It's such a shame that we couldn't um, hear you for parts of it and also your slides um, were not moving, um, um, you know, they were lagging slightly. So, but nevertheless, I really hope people found what they could hear very helpful. Um, thank you very much for, for joining um, and presenting that. Um, if you maybe just send me the slides as well, that'd be really helpful. Um, I'm going to now um, go to our Q&A session. We've got lots and lots of questions. I'm going to go to Jyoti Ben, who is going to be uh, facilitating the Q&A session with our panel today. Um, Jyoti Ben has been here for every single session from the start, from the 11th of March. Um, and here she is again today to kind of... Um, you know, go through some of these questions. We've got so many today, so many, and I'm sure we're not going to get through all of them. But without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Jyoti Ben. Thank you, Prof. Ben, Bhattandamara, Jai Jinendra, and thank you very much for joining us today. Um, so, Ajno Vise Kuba Jagat Yonote, um, ane ana arthritis na bada gutan na hips na problem thi nhs ma panch je consultations thai che emathi ek ana karane thai che ane ana kharcha bhi ghana che dar varse 10 billion pounds is the cost to the nhs due to musculoskeletal problems and because i pre bada ghana lambi umar sudhi jiviye che em ke che praja ni you know aging population ane e karane ana kharcha next 10 varas ma 10 gana vadhvana che etle this is a really important subject so thank you so much to our panel um, for giving us some really informative uh, advice I'm going to start, Ranjit, by with you. Um, your story is incredibly powerful. Um, can you tell us what motivated you once you woke up out of your coma? 
તમે મ્યુટ પર છો રંજીતભાઈ sorry thank you this all this technology started when i came out of um coal miner so it's going to be slow to catch up um yeah motivation is basically you want your independent so basically pehla so to ke ab jaate ji badu karta tha right i i mean uh, except cooking um badu you know jaate you know karano i like doing things by myself one thing is basically always pray to god is i never want to be dependent on anyone right but then you end up in a situation where it's like you know like i say i can't even do brush by myself yeah at that time so things is like just pushing you just get out you know like you're having bad dream you just want to get out of it just get up get up and you know start walking so is basically help with the family like you you want to you don't want to be a burden on your family in one way saying so, you know is is trying to say like oh you know it's not that they never thought that way but you know when you lose your independence is that is the push main push is that so you want to do things by yourself and you know it's like when my wife has to go to work he does i don't want her to be worrying about me saying you know oh why is he like is he okay why if he has fallen down or why is done you know so i just wanted to be at a certain stage before she goes back to work so i was trying to push myself you know mm. it, like, like i said a lot of help from the physio i know they came uh, even with the video they gave me some exercises which i was trying to do and they were encouraging me to increase and increase um yes i mean you know i, I couldn't obviously rely on um, you know like just on uh, like i say i never saw my gp it's been a year and a half i haven't seen my gp when i was say i have pain they said take the painkiller that's it nothing else so it's like you know you learn to self help you know you're just trying to do things by yourself so i said why not just trying to do rehab by myself by giving some exercises so doing some walks just next to like you know length of garden mm-hmm. i started doing that by myself steps menka showed me two steps i started doing three four five increased you know like few by few you know yeah. so yes yeah, so like one way is like you need someone to show you the way direction and then you need your um you need your uh, willpower net yeah. tamar portano um yeah willpower to it net to yeah, keep going course, yeah. Yeah. and actually tamara photo maranjit bhai tame uh, you know very very uh, emotional photos tamara family sathe tamara mother sathe how important was your family support to you that the like i said they were the first um, help when i opened my eyes like like i say you know when i came out of coma my wife was there so she was the first person i saw like she, i mean even though everyone was there they were holding my hands I had about hundreds of family members came all the way from Crawley, Leicester, everywhere, you know like when they heard the news. Yeah. Because, like I said my wife was told that I had only 1% chance so like so many people came around you know like to visit and all that. So all everybody came and went but when family was there so I wanted to be there for my family. My mom was there, my brother was there. So yes, you know just to like I said um and i'm sure that motivates you as well ne look when you join a bit them the protsan wale ne yes of course like i said when i didn't have any memory i mean um uh i was stuck 20 years behind i was stuck in 1998 there to retrain my brain slowly slowly to come back to <laughs> current time yeah. my wife had brought me a small you know digital clock so on that there's a time date and month and all that sort of stuff did not make any sense to me yeah just numbers i could recognize the numbers but i couldn't make any sense of it at all the memory is like you know all i could remember was having wife and two children that's in nothing else no age and nothing i could not remember and there was only time i was forgiven to forget my wedding anniversary <laughs> <laughs> don't do it again though yeah <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> thank you very much, Ranjit Bhai. That was a really emotional story. Thank you. Um, as uh, Prof. Laben said, Ajay, there are questions Ajay. So we'll try our best to answer all of them, but please forgive us. Jo, um, uh, I'm going to ask our panel if we can be very succinct with the answers uh, so that we can try and get through as many as possible. A couple of questions already. Can you have a patella replacement? Yes, the answer is you can have a patella femoral replacement. Uh, what's the difference between robotic knee surgery or normal knee surgery? The only difference is uh, as a surgeon who tamne kai sako ke normal surgery ma mota kap kare and a robotic surgery ma na 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 kap hoy so that's really the the biggest difference and obviously jo tamara na 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 kap hoy to any recovery tamne vadhare veli thase so hopefully jene sawal puchya che you got your answers um, so um, if we could just go to, um, obviously we've got lots of questions for both Menka Ben and Guru Dattai. Um, Guru Dattai, if I could ask you, what's the most painful type of arthritis? Depends on the severity. So uh, hip arthritis can be really severe. So can knee arthritis. You can get arthritis that affects the spine as well. Um, in terms of the types of arthritis, we talked about the inflammatory ones, Gout, gout is incredibly painful, yeah. typically. It's excruciatingly painful, and it can affect the big toe, the knee. So that's probably one of the most uh, painful, along with infective arthritis. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. So, um, they suffer with spinal difficulties. They've got osteoarthritis in both knees. Um, um, already exercises kasrat to kareche, but what other advice can you give them? Are there any other exercises you can recommend? You're on mute, Venka Ben. Sorry. Um, no. Definitely. I think I, I would say that go see a physio, to be honest. Go to a GP, get a referral. There's lots. Of, I mentioned it. I don't know if you saw it on my slides, but I mentioned there's also different tool sets that physios use. There's different types of exercises. Um, we even use other um Sort of other referrals into like orthotics and things so we can do taping um maybe a bit of acupuncture alongside the exercises and then build up the exercises so it might be the baseline's wrong maybe we need to start somewhere else uh, maybe work on um smaller range movements more sort of static based what i mean is like doing a, maybe a muscle exercise where you're not actually moving the joint too much so it's not too painful so you might need to revise the exercise but the best person to do that would be a physio to completely have uh, a new look, reassess everything, look at the range, the movement, look at the pain limitations and give it a whole new um, new, new rehab goals, really. So best thing is physiotherapy, so that you have an appointment, you can't do new exercises. On that note, actually, Menka Ben, I have a question. They've had spinal stenosis and degenerative disc disease for over 20 years. Um, 2016, my amino spinal fu fusion operation got you through. Unfortunately, post-operatively, I have an operation for CSF no leak got you through. Um, and nerve roots with our uh, adhesions, you know, choti uh, And compounded to that, the, the, the discs have degenerated. Um, exercises recommend Gari Shako? Obviously the, the spinal, the, the joints, the, yeah, so the bones obviously have deteriorated quite a lot. So it would be very much focusing on strengthening the muscles around it. So maybe some more gentle, which movements that perhaps don't have to implement, like Pilates would be really good, perhaps building up core exercises around those joints. Um, and they don't have to be too difficult. They can be done in a lying position, which is supportive, but still stabilizing those areas and really build up the, the muscles and structures around it. You've got ligaments there as well. Um, and that could be something that they could try. But again, go see a physio perhaps that specializes in Pilates. The GPs can refer you to a musculoskeletal specialist and they tend um, that is uh, as part of. Brilliant, thank you. So before you go, um, Dr. Guru, don't worry, Tamara might be kind of other questions, Jeff, but I'm gonna try and bunch up Menka Ben's ones. So, um, a knee replacement surgery, got it, the thrown and then they've had physiotherapy, they've had exercises to do, but they can only achieve an 88 degree bend 
નીચે બેસીને એ લોકો એક્સરસાઇઝ નથી કરી શકતા નીચે બેસી બી નથી શકતા વોટ એડવાઇઝ કેન યુ ઓફર ધેમ So again similarly trying something different um with with that with that scenario where there's a real issue with sort of making that joint move any more hydrotherapy would be definitely worth a, a, a go um it's the buoyancy of the water takes away sort of the weight of the joint and you can tend to move it a lot better um and we mustn't shy away from those sort of traditional things that we used to do make sure the joint area is nice and warm make sure you're stretching before your exercises don't be stiff when you do it so you know get that fluid moving get the circulation moving before you try that um so hydrotherapy is usually run by a physiotherapist and if you get a referral for for brain anyway the way it works here is you get a referral in through your gp you actually see a physio who assesses you beforehand make sure that they will basically send you to the right groups because they tend to group it together i know with covid restrictions things are a bit different but they are opening up so it's not completely no no so that would be my advice to try that perhaps and i think we underestimate the power of water don't we um you know and and anti resistant exercises in a pool um dr gurda that um apre chare knee replacement kariye chhe ne i mean i don't do it because that's not my surgery but tame chare karo sho kya it does it affect the length of the leg it can do uh, so if you have a flexion contracture before your knee replacement then the aim of part of the aim of the operation is to straighten the knee so effectively you'll find that the leg actually returns to a normal length compared to before so it might be slightly longer but it should match the other side it's quite rare for to actually lengthen the leg physically when you compare it to the other side unless it's been a major operation so if you've had a revision knee replacement or if you've had previous fractures something like that it's actually relatively unusual to change the length of the leg i would be looking at um, the hip joint if there is a problem with the length of the leg okay and um jare tame knee replacement got or total knee replacement um is it normal within a few days after the operation to bend the knee to 90 degrees Or yeah, would you yeah. wait for that? No, you should try and do that as soon as possible really. Right. So that's good for recovery. Yeah. yeah, within the first, you know, couple of days you should be aiming to get to that to, to that degree. And if not then then within the first week because otherwise okay. uh, if you leave it too long then stiffness can set in and then you need further procedures. And if you're a gluten hip replacement ke joint ni surgery kar liye to tarat it manas niche besi sake palati wale ne or is that yeah. not is that contraindicated no i think that does though it will be very difficult they have to get the power the muscle strength back karan ka me operation vakte we we have to go through the tendons the muscle we have to cut that we have to repair it it's actually difficult for the patients to do some of those activities and the bend as well so you need to get way beyond 90 degrees to sit palati varin so yeah. um, maybe later on we could we should certainly aim for that yeah but not that at not no no okay um someone else no question have it um march march have we seen march em no uh, they had an orif it le um uh, elboma um ane um bad divas pachi plaster karina kitu um they've now got very little movement ne lo kone chinta thai che is this normal yeah so uh, it sounds like they had a fracture at the elbow and yeah. they had a cast put on and the cast taken off 12 days later so the elbow is a bit like the knee joint it doesn't like being kept immobile for a long period so certainly in the last few years we try and mobilize the elbow as soon as we can if it's been fixed properly then you should be able to move the elbow early um so uh, if there's a problem with the movement then they should be seeing hopefully they should have an appointment with their surgeon soon uh and they should certainly be having physiotherapy if they're struggling with um you know their movement the range of movement brilliant thank you for these uh, i know they're quick fire questions but oh, yeah. i love you i'm trying to get through as many as we can yeah. um menka ben here's a, a rather unusual one for you um someone's been shot in their right hand um have it um now little fingers i feel like on a problem tighter uh basically they can't close they've said i can't close my finger uh with other three fingers so i'm assuming they can't move it laterally i'm not sure but enematisu uh, exercise kari sake um so there's these exercises you can do with with putty so putty's a bit like play doh um and you can sort of rub it in your hands pull it there's all these different ways you can use it the hand therapy is typically done by an occupational therapist um but it's just 
just because of experience that I tend to know about, but they can be really useful because you can you can put the putty and they come in different strengths, a bit like resistance bands. You can put them around your fingers and then pull them open. So you're, you're working against resistance. And again, you can start off with sort of like a static based exercise. So you're not having to move much, but you're building up the muscles around it. But I think um, it would it'd be worthwhile for that person to go and actually see a specialist just to check that the nerves are working correctly, that the muscles and the tendon joints and everything are connected and, and well. So perhaps having um, an orthopedic or even maybe a neuro referral and then seeing sort of a specialist around that area would be worth it. And maybe even an occupational therapist in hand therapy. But putty exercise is something you can even do from home from now. Yeah. Um, I've even had people, I've said to people like, you know, all those sorts of things. Start doing it in chores. What There's lots of things you can do. Ball. You can be really inventive. Or, or like balls. Yeah, yeah. squeezy yeah. balls. Yeah, yeah, that can be really good. But if you're aiming for opening your hand, then the squeezy balls are not going to help as much because you want to open. Yeah. So the, the, the putty literally goes around the hand and then you're opening it out. So you could use, it's a bit like if you think, if you're using like an elastic band, don't use an elastic band, but like that, mm-hmm. you're trying to open out and work against that resistance to move the muscles. So if you hopefully build up the muscles, because it might be the, the lack of muscle that might be kind of hindering the movement as well. So it needs an assessment so, really. Well, on, talking about muscle wasting, they've got osteoarthritis and in their right hand, they've got wasted muscle. Uh, between thumb and first finger. It lay no shape, but I've been nothing of it. And it might have come to the last in circle. Exactly the same. Yeah. Putty exercises, yeah, putty. balls, and and all those things would really work. Yeah. Can you buy a resistance band for the hand? Yeah, definitely. You, it you, can be laced. I mean, to be yeah. fair, you could even use, uh, you could probably look on Amazon. There's okay. lots of websites. And if you sort of go um, on to even perhaps some physio accredited ones like CSP, they'll give you some examples. But you can improvise at home. I mean, I don't encourage people to even buy weights. You know, nothing an old sock with some lentils can't manage, you know, bottles with lentils in them, soups, soup tins, and, you know, all sorts of things can manage. With something that's elastic, if you get the scrunchy hairbands, they're yeah. not so harsh on your hand. So they're the ones with the velvet around them. You could even start with something like that. And then until you get that referral. But I, I still like my putty exercises. Yeah, um, no, they're really, they're really good. And they, yeah, and they come in different resistances and you can do so much with it. Yeah. No, that's really useful. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to move quickly on. Uh, and sorry, um, if that's okay. Um, so, um, uh, uh, Dr. Gurudath, if I can come to you. Um, so, for someone's had osteoporosis for the past seven years, so how are they going to know they need a replacement? So, uh, if they have osteoarthritis, yeah, os- osteoporosis. Porosis. Porosis, okay. So, osteoporosis is where you have thinning of the bones, and that can be due to a lack of vitamin D or calcium. So you, you may not necessarily get pain from osteoporosis because it affects all the bones, not just one joint. And if you're not on treatment for it, then you, you probably need it investigated. So seeing your GP in the first instance, they might do something called a DEXA scan, and that can determine if you have osteoporosis. And they can put you on some supplements, either vitamin D, or calcium, and there's a medication that you can sometimes take once a week, um, which can help as well. So that's the kind of um, the treatment you should be having at the moment. But typically, if it's pain, then it might be something else, like osteo- osteoarthritis. And vitamin D, on that note, um, uh, YouTube, my question, vitamin D, no, um, is it normal? COVID vitamin D, but do we need it for bone health? We do, yeah. I think South Asians in the UK and in Europe are actually one of the highest groups uh, at risk of osteoporosis. For a what number- dose? So we need, we should be having at least a thousand international units a day. That's the general advice. Yeah. And do you recommend that a thousand units, let that bella, um, uh, uh, they should have a vitamin D blood test done? Ke put you standard level do it? I think standard level do it. Yeah, just, so just take it. In this country, yeah. Yeah, perfect. No, thank you very much. Um, so um, somebody's got problems with their radial nerve. Um, are there any specific exercises or treatments for that? 
problems associated with radial nerve so, and radial nerve treatment. It's, yeah, not, so, it's a very general. Yeah, so thing. radial nerve is responsible for uh, this kind of action. So straightening the, uh, the wrist, straightening the fingers, uh, the thumb. And so if there's a, a nerve injury, then uh, obviously that needs to be investigated. But exercises to do would be um, things that help uh, maintain that range of motion. Otherwise, you can get contractures. Uh, and so making sure that the fingers and the hand, the wrist are kept stretching uh, regularly. And you can even have splints that keep the fingers and the wrist out at certain positions. But again, they should be seeing a physiotherapist uh, for that kind of problem if it's a chronic issue. If it's associated with an injury, then that needs to be investigated soon. Yeah. So people who have got lupus, do they benefit from physiotherapy regularly? Maybe Menka Ben, you could come in here. So yeah, lupus is a respiratory condition. So having um, respiratory exercises, so breathing exercises, so you find exercises everywhere. There's good exercises to sort of increase your lung capacity, make sure you're breathing at the bases of your lungs, making sure that you're able to clear your secretions well with sort of limited uh, work of breathing, making sure things like, because you can literally, the position that you're in as well, like sitting up is better than lying down. Um, it's, even through COVID, we've learned that proning, being on your front, is a good position for your lungs. So similarly also, in, with but, other conditions. But it's also a systemic condition. So I think this person is probably referring more to the systemic manifestations, because particularly, I know it can affect your lungs, but you can also get skin manifestations, joint manifestations. I know I see them because they sometimes have renal manifestations. So, so I suppose with today's topic in mind, this person is going around to joints. Um, so, joints. so, so yeah, same thing. Absolutely. It's worth having to go. If you've not had a go um, and had physio before, then it's definitely worth having, uh, having a assessment with the physiotherapist and seeing them. Um, like I said, right at the beginning, with anything, it's an assessment basis and you work from a baseline and you move forward and you try different options. And every physio will come with their own toolkit. For example, acupuncture, I, can, I use it on some patients yeah. where, where I find that I'm not getting somewhere with something as simple as exercise. I'll try and use an adjunct to help me with that. So I might use acupuncture to sort of change the brain chemistry to maybe depict less um, pa uh, pain so that I can manage a bit more movement. Things like that. TENS machines are really good electrotherapy. Um, so there's lots of different things. And like I said, every physio will come with their own tool set. So it's and worthwhile having another assessment. Starting again. Is there any role to, neither of you have mess, uh, mentioned massaging. Um, is there any, you know, whether it's deep tissue massage or a sports massage, massage to go roll to, particularly good done, Either of you, I don't know, Dr. Buddha, so, do you want to, or Menka <laughs> Yeah, go for it. It's probably more men come in. Uh, <laughs> so you're right. Rather than massage, because that term's a bit loose for physios, we're not misuses, but we do use like sports massage. We would use deep friction massage, but it would have to be at the right time. Massage is very short lived. It feels lovely when we have it, and we all love them, but they are short lived. So you have to have the right reasons for doing something like deep, deep friction. And you do find that more in sort of your sports physio type of things um, on the football pitch. Uh, but you you don't, to be fair, in my everyday practice, typically my experience, I don't tend to use it too much. Um, it can help in some circumstances if you've got a muscle that's really stiff, a joint that's not working great, and you feel that if you can just get hands on in there, perhaps manipulate that muscle or break down the tendons a bit, or if you've got a bit of scar tissue built up somewhere that you can use sort of friction techniques there. So they do have their place, but again, it's about assessment, looking at all the options, what's been tried, what's worked, what's not worked, and, and sort of having that whole look to, to decide what works. Oh, brilliant. Um, it, this is a very specific question. Um, somebody uh, recently, Buddy Gyatta, and I'm a collarbone my fracture to you, um, so, um, orthopedic surgeon and B options up here. Doctor Guru, that maybe you can come in here. Um, operation no kido tu kya to pachi am kido ke ate kui mani mere heal thejo se. And uh, this person opted for a sling and to give it natural time to heal. Ate kui pachi X-ray ni rajo ite, but in the meantime, they're worried ke runjavi jo se ni mere, or is it going to take longer? 
Yeah, so vast majority, I'd say more than 90% of clavicle fractures we manage without an operation uh, because they usually heal so well. Uh, if unless the, the clavicle is really displaced, so if it's not together and it's like this, really, really far apart, or if there's another fracture in the limb, then we would suggest operating on it. But most fractures, unless it's really displaced, like I said, uh, we manage clavicle fractures with, with just a sling uh, for a few weeks and then gradual rehabilitation. And uh, sometimes, you know, varlag, it can take weeks, sometimes two, three, four months to heal. Yeah. Uh, but it just some patience. The operation itself, if you do, if you think about the structures around here, you've got big vessels, the lung, mm. it's not without risk. Break your plexus. People find the plate is very prominent and they end up having a second operation. So it's worth going down this non-operative route to start with and then see. You're doing yourself out of a job, Dr. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's somebody who's prone to sprains and fractures. Um, how can they stay healthy? Now they've asked the question, should I wear flat shoes? So I'm uh, assuming that this is a lower limb problem. Menkaben, um, maybe, can you advise anything? I'm not quite sure why they're prone yeah, to sprains so. and fractures. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not sure either, so um, I can't comment on that side of it. But um, it's about strengthening yourself. So I would go on what I was talking about with strengthening your muscles as much as possible. You know, how if you've got the joints there, protect them. Make your muscles around them, the supporting um, structures around them as strong as possible. Start with something that's uh, resistive, like band work, perhaps, static exercises, and then build up to more dynamic ones. Um, again, perhaps hydrotherapy might be an option if, if, if it feels restrictive. Um, yeah, I think that would be the way to go. Um, as for the flat shoes, I would say no. <laughs> Your arch is there for a reason. And actually, if anything, um, if you don't have arch, people that have flat feet um, ha tend to benefit from like an orthotics referral for like a, a bit of an arch um, structure to put in their shoes. Um, and I have also found that those sort of people that have flat feet or uh, prone to sort of issues like that tend to have more issues with their knees and hips as well. Mm. Um, so I would definitely say focus on strengthening the muscles and the structures around it. Maybe see an orthotic person, perhaps if you feel that you do have a bit of a flat foot and you, if you I wouldn't advise flat, flat shoes. If anything, I'd say go for a wedge shoe. In, and inserts maybe as well. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah and inserts, yeah. Right, no, thank you. I'm, I'm moving quickly, I'm sorry. I, I'm moving on and because it's love that here. Um, Dushaba, can I bring you in? Um, because um, we've heard a lot today, you know, particularly Gutano Lukaumate, uh, you know, I think Ranjit Payabiki Duke Dorvaras, GP Nanati Maria, they just keep giving painkillers. What's your take on that? I mean, it's been so hard for people to see their GP. So it's more important for people to go to the pharmacy. Yes. So thank you, Jodivin. Uh, during the COVID, it has been very important for to go and see the GP hospital appointment everybody cancel the HA. So, which is what I mentioned at the last webinar, the pharmacist does play a big part in all of this. Yeah, they're quite highly trained in uh, all these uh, problems, issues. Okay, not as experts as the professionals out there, but medication upper and look out how your first point of call is obviously the pharmacist. And as I explained last time, Doctor ne appointment kar bhi Specialist thar mein ani appointment to pharmacies you can walk in be seen within ten minutes. Yeah, so that's the advantage. So like, yes, thirty thirty hoy go and see your pharmacist. They will give you some medication or prescribe something for you to help you whilst you're waiting for your appointment. Yeah. Yeah. And and Adam, I know kita me. Um, you're not working currently as a pharmacist, yeah. um, uh, but but um, you know, joints per voltron or cream, and okay, side effects, because absorption to bow or too tight, and then take other anti inflammatories orally, sorry, orally at lay up a body kaya. So, yes, there are side effects, but anti inflammatories as a rule. When you rub it in, and our side effects are very minimal. So I won't worry. No about. absorption, nothing. That you know, no loima. Yeah. And what's your high absorption type? But it's the stomach which is causing the problem. Stomach ma. Correct. It causes upset stomach. Yeah. And um, 
on that note, Tushabayatyare Kanabada or la cannabis um oils and lotions vaporate, ne? Joins Mate. Um what what's your advice on that? Well again, uh, <clears throat> I'm not it's an legal, you can buy it in the shops. <laughs> yes, you can now go and buy it. Okay. It's help, it's providing some beneficial effects to uh, some patients, but not everybody, yeah. So I, I'm on the fence on that uh, medication, CBD oils, as I call them, yeah? Yeah, that's right. Yes, yes. Yeah. Because I know Dr. Guru that mentioned capsaicin, didn't you? Um, yeah. And you can get topical preparations for that as well. Yeah, that's right. And it's been, uh, you know, nice actually advise using it uh, or giving it giving it a go along with uh, anti-inflammatory cream. So if you haven't tried it, uh, you know, give that a go. And it, it can as well as as well as topical, like yes, yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, if one hasn't worked, then try the other. Um, but the other thing is. If you can't afford it, you can actually make chili extract cream at home. Apparently, I've not tried it, but um, maybe worth it. <laughs> especially the sideline you're doing, is it? <laughs> <laughs> but then it gets to order more yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to do a couple more because we are absolutely running out of time. Um, so, um, the the person who sent a question about right knee problem, a look replacement need ajoite. It's taking a lot longer due to COVID. What can I do for pain? I hope kitamaro sawal no jawab madi kya se guru dad bhaiye ghano bada options apya time na talk ma. So I I'm I'm hoping that's answered. Um, Someone's had early menopause at 40. They've got uh, maybe Menka Ben, this is for you, uh, pain in the pelvic muscles. Uh, they also have aches and pains in their knees and their calves and their feet and their ankles. So they're struggling to get out of bed in the morning. And Enamata Tamisu exercises recommend Karishoko. So maybe something like Pilates would be really good as well. Something that doesn't overexert you, but starts building up the muscles, and then slowly you can hopefully work into the joints in that in that scenario. So something more static based. So you could even start with lying down exercises that work the the muscles and still stabilize like your back and your area because you're on, on a on a surface. That would help. They would they should definitely go see a physio. That would really help because they can give them a tailored exercise program. They can see what they can do, what sort of their strength is like the flexibility is like, and then they can devise a whole program for them that they'll be able to start off on a baseline and then progress slowly. And without going into any specifics for yourself, Menkabin, you know, particularly because uh, they're not doing face-to-face -face consultations uh, as much. Um, and uh, and so you know phone for a local vat karete then they'll say ke physio ne refer karete any bigitli rajoi parete right so what's a ballpark figure for an hourly cost if somebody wants to privately found find uh, a physiotherapist you know are we talking 100 pounds 200 pounds 500 pounds kitla as asre kitla karcha thai just so people know right i think it really yeah so i think it really varies i think there are some physios giving online assessments and and information so they would I would assume would be a bit less because they're not face to face they're not a home visit so something online where you're not able to go into clinic although I know some clinics are now opening typically I'd say anything from about 30 pounds to 50 pounds but that's for a review um, so that's a half an hour session your assessment sessions tend to be a bit more because it tends to be a bit more length and there's a lot more for the physio to work out um, but they do range you can if you I would certainly say shop around for home visits, I know it's a bit more. Um, they can be anything from 60 to 70 pounds to um, 150 pounds. Um, and that's usually about 45 minutes per session. And it's done in your home. So that also depends on the amount of travel time that they're having to do. So they can, they can really vary a little bit. Um, but they are available. They are out there. You can find um, private physios just by going onto the Charter Society of Physiotherapy website. And they should be able to give you a list always check that they're uh, registered and chartered physiotherapists though. And to put that into perspective, you know, let's put this all into perspective, right? And I and I back This is an investment. So please everybody put this into this cost into a perspective. Last question. Um, so diffuse 
idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis dish. Um, this is where obviously your ligaments attaching to the spine start getting hard. Calcium build up tight enema. It's my enema to so precautions. Um, what can this person who's got dish, what, what advice can we give them? So um, there's a couple of conditions like that. And the similar one is ankylosing spondylitis. Um, usually it affects several joints, but the spine is really affected. And this whole spine, it becomes very, very stiff, just like one solid uh, piece of bone. Um, so it's actually difficult to prevent uh, once it starts. But the key thing is as soon as you start uh, getting some stiffness to work on exercises, physiotherapy, to really keep as mobile as you can for as long as possible. So you, you must have a physiotherapy input for that. Um, there isn't a great surgical solution for that. Um, but um, Menka Bennett, if there's anything uh, specific that you, you know about uh, that condition. Nothing specific comes to mind, to be honest, but with anything that's gonna obviously harden up your spine and immobilize you in that way, it is early intervention, like you say, it's doing the exercise in regular with them to way too often to get patients who have done exercise, have been given the programs, and then the physio stops coming or they stop going whichever way it is, and they lose that motivation, they stop doing the exercises, and you, you will get a re-referral within a year or so with the same problem or slightly worse because they haven't kept up with the exercises. Please keep doing those exercises. If you've been given a program, the physio will tend to say, keep going, don't stop, do this many sets. When you reach a certain target, aim for a bit higher. So if you can do 10 sets, uh, 10 rep repetitions, and you can do three sets of them, go for 11, go for 12, keep building, keep going, keep pushing yourself until you reach that ceiling and then maintain it there. I think there's not enough um, sort of uh, fight given for that maintenance, you know, keep going because there are like this condition here, you know, there isn't really any anything else. So you want to kind of reduce that sort of um, fast paced deterioration as much as possible. So it's keep doing those exercises, keep moving. And they can be very simple. It can be things like where you're, you're in a sitting position, you're sort of twisting, you're turning side to side, you're just moving as much as you can. You reach at the top, you're reaching down. There's so many, I mean, I'd need a whole session for that, but that can be just a basic start. What you can move, you know, just if you think about your spine and how it, it works in, a, in all sorts of different ways, try and just sort of reach down, see how far you can go. Can you touch your knees? Can you go further down? How far, how far do you go? Keep practicing that. Do that a few times. Remember there's stiffness and there's stiffness that you can work through. So until you keep going and feel that resistance, get that circulation going, you can, you can go far. And again, another one would be hydrotherapy can work right. quite well for someone. And, like and not to, go, you know, Lambo Samay Sudi Besi like Dr. Guru that says, keep moving around. And eventually, I think, Anamata support brace the application. There are support braces for the spine. Tushar um, Bai, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me, Mada. Ik bebija questions for you too. I know we're overrunning, but I mean, this this is obviously so important. But we've, we've still got 400 over 400 people watching. Um, so it's it's obviously such an important subject. Um, so, Menka ben tamara mate, osteoarthritis na patient emnemate, just a quick answer. Is it okay to do chair exercises using, you know, legs, hands, um, hips, etc.? cetera? Uh, yes or no? Absolutely, yeah. yes. Yes, okay, yes, yes. brilliant. Um, and uh, any any idea, um, anyone have any take on um, uh, healthy for uh, bone health? You know, nowadays, uh, Holland and Barrett, you can buy turmeric capsules. Uh, you know, who would think of taking a turmeric capsule, right? But this is now the trend. Is there any, Dr. Guru, that, is there any uh, evidence that this is of any benefit to us? So I think it has some anti-inflammatory properties, actually. So I think that's, you know, goes, probably goes back to thousands of years in terms of uh, yeah. Vedic medicine. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it's it's not yet prescribed on the NHS, but I'm sure it's just a matter of time. <laughs> it, you know, depends. you have bright, bright yellow food, right? <laughs> yeah, I think we, we, we have it a lot. Yeah. Uh, but you can also, if you have a you know painful joint, you can wrap uh, you know some cream with healthy in it, and uh, that might help as well. So, uh, along with everything else, so there's not. I think with arthritis, the key is to remember there's not just one solution. Try and go for multimodal treatments. 
on that note, man, yate ikwakat mara father ne ankul maduktu tu, and he actually did put a paste of um, something with haldi in it. That I saw ne bivat kariya so Dr. Guru that they were there, but I remember, and then he put a plaster on it, which at the end was all yellow. <laughs> I remember that. We've had a couple of questions actually on uh, locked, um, you know, trigger finger. Now uh, somebody's got a trigger thumb. And it's locked. They've had a steroid injection. Man, how do you be movement na thema? And they just have to move karvata. They how do you have to do it? Does this person need an operation, Doctor Guruda? Yeah, quite. Or by check. So, so tr trigger thumb is where the thumb doesn't bend properly. It just gets stuck like that, and it and they and they get pain around here. Um, so commonly, we used to operate on these a lot, but unfortunately, because of some of the uh, the cost implications in the NHS, the waiting lists, you know, um, CCGs and things have limited the use of this operation. So you have to get over so many hurdles in order to try and uh, get this operation funded. So if they've tried uh, splints, if they've tried steroid injections and they failed that, then, you know, their doctor should be referring them for uh, an operation. Yeah. So and, and it can help. It's, a, it's an easy operation. It can be in the local anesthetic. It takes 10 minutes. It's uh, very simple. And how do you relieve trigger finger? So it's the same pathology. Uh, so instead of trig uh, the triggering of the thumb, it's the finger that stops, that doesn't fully bend like that. So you get suddenly it just gets stuck like that and it can be painful. And the operation just involves making a little incision usually around here. And there's a, a, a band that stops um, some of the movements of the tendon that moves the finger. So it's just making more space for that tendon to move really. Brilliant. So um, when you've got damaged cartilage, Dr. Gurudev, what's better, arthroscopic surgery or just leaving it to heal naturally? So again, depends on the cartilage damage. So they might have been told they have a meniscal tear. Meniscus is like the cushion we talked about, a bit like cartilage in the knee joint. If we scanned, you know, a thousand people, we'll probably find 10% of them with a meniscal tear and no symptoms. So if you have no symptoms from the meniscal tear, no need for an operation, but you're getting, if you're getting clear symptoms, which are mechanical with certain activities like twisting, crouching, stair climbing, in that specific area that the scanner showed there is a meniscal tear, then uh, an op a, you know, keyhole surgery might be appropriate, but it's not the solution for everyone. Thank you. And I promise this is the last question. <laughs> so is, uh, can you get foot drop after a, a, a total hip replacement? Is that, is, that a, is that a known complication? So it's something that we mentioned, but it's very rare. Uh, so when we do an operation, uh, we use uh, retractors. Once we make the incision, uh, we kind of spread the tissues, the muscle, and there's a big sciatic nerve at the back of the hip, which supplies, uh, amongst other things, the foot and allows your ankle to go up and down. So sometimes that nerve can be stretched as part of the operation and temporarily you can get a foot drop. Even rarer is a, an actual injury to the nerve. So the nerve gets cut and, and that would be potential very long-term consequences of foot drop. But it's very rare complication. You know, I would say less than uh, one in 500 patients have a hip placement would, would, would get a foot drop, maybe even rarer than that. Amazing. Thank you so much, Dr. Gurudev. And, and thank you, Menka Ben. I'm so sorry. I know it's been like a exam you you But you, you'd be pleased to know you've both passed with flying colours. Thank you very much. And, and thank you to everybody who's submitted so many questions. Uh, questions There are a few that are still outstanding. So I'm sorry, uh, but thank you very much. And just remember, you know, there are alternative recommendations, Dr. Guru that happened in And um, and finally, um, we cannot underestimate. Uh, the power of a physiotherapist. So don't wait for years on the NHS. Privately, and remember, a physiotherapist's advice is for life. Thank you. Thank you, um, everyone. Wow, what an amazing session. And we could have gone on and on. I think we've got so many questions still. It's been Amazing. I'm already getting lots of really, really good feedback from people as well. So 
Great. Thank you, everyone. Um, so got, la our last session was actually about heart care and we had a live demonstration of C basic CPR. And St. John's Ambulance very kindly gave us two basic CPR courses that we could give away to our viewers. And we've got two winners. So I'm going to announce the winners now. And um, so our winners of the two basic CPR courses are Titik Shasha and Vishal Shah. And you'll be both be getting an email from me tomorrow with all the um, information about how to book your courses. Going to pass um, you over to Tushaba has got something to say to us. And then I think Ranjit Pai just has one little thing to say to everyone. Um, and then I'm going to come back to close the event and talk about our next event. Tushaba. Okay, well, thank you. Um, thank you, Gurudat, and uh, thank you, Menka Ben, and uh, Ranjit Pai. Of course, our think topic, though, is very important, affects all of us sooner or later, as does all the other health topics I've had choose over the last five weeks. Uh, I hope that I've done a lot of work and I've done a lot of work. And as has uh, been posted on the YouTube channel, क्या बदी वीडियोस तुम्हें पाची जो इस गोचो माफ कर जो आज मैं कभी नो आई थिंक कनेक्शन एवरी नाउ एंड देन वही उठा तो तो इट हैपेंस टेक्नोलॉजी इट हैपेंस इट्स कोई नो वाट नथिंग है मैं बट इफ आई कैन जस्ट रिक्वेस्ट मैं कभी तुम्हारे स्लाइड शो हो तो आर यू एबल टू शेयर इट विथ अस yeah so if you are to see what we can do is go uh, going to channel away that information as slide going to stop me thija thati if you send an email to our at oshwal.org our website manager so we will send you that slide show that menka ben had presented so at least tumara tumara time mein vaachi sako chho and all the other events tumhe apna badha webinars tumhe pachi bhi youtube ma chhoi sako chho yeah at your in your own time at your own leisure and recommend it to others as well but today apro chatto che an important session we are going to carry on with this every two weeks or so uh profila will introduce the, the next one apro webinar so che बट आज आप बात सांभे तरह चार वक्त आप सांभ्यू कि हम होस्पिटल हम खुला मिली है डॉक्टर्स आर स्टार्टिंग टू सी पेशेंट्स अगेन आप प्रोफेशनल्स यू नो इट टेक सम टाइम टू गेट होल्ड ऑफ गुरु दर्द गेट होल्ड ऑफ मेन का इट्स नॉट इजी देर लाइफ आर वेरी बिजी एंड देर ऑल्सो गेटिंग वेरी बिजी सो टूडे आई वोट टू थैंक वन पर्सन स्पेशली यू नो अँ के टाइम अपने भोगव्यो इन हर प्रोफेशनल लाइफ ये તમે બધાએ જોયું છે ડોક્ટર જ્યોતિ હેઝ બીન હેલ્પિંગ અસ ફોર ધ લાસ્ટ 6 સેશન્સ પ્રિપેરિંગ ધ સ્લાઇડ શોઝ પ્રિપેરિંગ ધ ક્વેશ્ચન્સ એક્સપ્લેનેશન્સ ફાઇન્ડિંગ ધ રાઈટ પ્રોફેશનલ્સ રાઈટ લાઈફ શું કહેવાય એક્ઝામ્પલ્સ આ જે રંજીતભાઈ હતા ધ લાસ્ટ બે વીક પહેલા આપણે બીજા બેનો હતી સો યુ નો ઇટ ટેક્સ ટાઈમ એન્ડ આઈ હેવ ટુ ગીવ રિયલી અપ્લોઝ ટુ ડોક્ટર જ્યોતિ બેન she has actually said ke no commitment at lo badu vadhi gyu che with the hospitals opening up ke no uh, workload is now 24 hours 7 days a week jeu thai gyu che more or less yeah so today she is joining us for a i call it last session just for another day or so <laughs> huh? but it's she, not I mean, it's not last session it's a temporary break i let out you for a day so ek divas ni break yes. ek divas ni break day is happening my, my partner in crime is not leaving it's just <laughs> a temporary break huh apra oshwal ma ek che apri rivat che ke once you join you can't go and a small print why you know to na apre koi ne vachavta hai nahi but i'm sure look um Dr Jyoti will join us again she has got a great uh, amount of knowledge but that topics man and she been a huge asset to us all on all these webinars so i think the mabda bethao or shwas non shwas the mede jota please give her a round of applause i know she can't hear it but we are all with you and uh, she will continue to support us as and when she can going forward yeah in the meantime um, uh, profila ben and himself myself am a chair and amara hemal ben who's also our co-host as a chair we going to continue with this uh, webinars and uh, of course in the background dr jyoti to hase as in when we can help uh, when she can help us so thank you dr jyoti thank you over to you profila ben thank you and you're not escaping that easy so i will i will be coming back to you um uh, you know and you have promised to do those two cancer sessions for us Uh, regardless of this so they're in the diary for a bit later on in the year and we're going to do those um i want to thank all of our panel today so you know everyone has been giving up their time
to do this. We started our first one on the 11th of March, and you know we're now almost at the end of May. Um, they've been really great. We've got some amazing case studies, and people have really, really appreciated some of the knowledge that they've gained from this. But you know, more than anything else, when we started this, we wanted to start a conversation in the community, and we definitely have done that with some of the sessions that we. We did, particularly with something like mental health, which is what we started with. Um, our next session, um, which will be on June the 10th, Thursday evening, 8 o'clock, same channel, uh, Oshawa YouTube channel. Uh, we're going to talk about eye care and particularly focusing on the recent times when we've all had so much screen time and what has been the impact of that on our eyes and particularly looking at also young people and children, because a friend of mine was telling me last week, the uh, amount of young children that have certainly got prescription glasses, you know, an absolute explosion, because we've all been doing so much more work on screens. Um, so this is going to be our topic on 10th of June. Um, and we're going to sort of explore the, the, the conditions for eyes, but also what can we do to help ourselves? Because there are apparently exercises you can do and there are, you know, here we go, talking about exercises again, Minka Ben, but there are exercises we can do for our eyesight as well. So thank you for joining us. Um, Gurudev Bhai, very nice to meet you on screen. But, you know, one of these days, I'm sure we're going to meet at Jyoti Ben's house when we when we are all allowed to do all of that again. Um, and Ranjit Bhai, I don't know what to say. That Just the story, just absolutely unbelievable, incredible, actually. But you've got something to say, haven't you, as well, before we close this evening's event? Yes, yeah. definitely. definitely. Um, like I said in the beginning uh, as well, it's like thanks to all the surgeons who saved my life um, uh, in the hospital. Uh, without them, like I say, going with 1% chance of surviving and coming back, it wouldn't have been possible. Then getting back, um, help with the physios, uh, you know, to trying to get back to normal life. Even though I'm not even halfway, I'm at only 20%, but step by step, I'm going to try and get there. And also a big thank you to the pharmacist. Uh, to um, thank you. Uh, I would like to mention is, although I haven't seen my GP for a year and a half, but my pharmacist, because I couldn't obviously get to um, a pharmacy to collect the medicines, they used to come home and deliver the you know, medications to me. Uh, being on um, so many medications, like in every week, they used to come and drop the medications. So like, even in this lockdown, they were they were really really big help, you know. So I would like to thank everyone. Thank big thanks to NHS. We know sometimes think uh, I've been paying NHS money all this time. Where there has money been going and stuff like that. But you know, when it comes to the person whose life been saved, uh, I would like you know, indebted to them for the rest of my life. Thank you so much, doctors and uh, the surgeons, pharmacists, neurologists, every, all NHS. Thank nurses. you Nurses. So Don't forget nurses. Oh, yes. Oh, nurses. <laughs> <laughs> nurses were like, you know, like like uh, your second mother in the hospital. Like I said, I was there eight months. That was my second home for eight months. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Um. Thank you. And thank you for sharing that story with us. I know it wasn't easy. And, you know, when we were talking about this last week, it was, I wasn't sure even that you, you, you would do it, but you said you'd do it and you've done it. So thank you. Brilliant. Um, thank right. you to our audience who've been joining us, you know, every fortnight and please continue to join us. And um, Jyoti Ben, thank you. Parish, I know, is going to thank me for having you back. Um, even if it's for a few more hours every Thursday. Um, thanks very much, everybody. I just want to also thank our um, IT team for keeping us, you know, on the straight and narrow today. So Nikunj by Hemel Ben, thank you very much. Um, and we'll be back on the 10th of June. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.